Well, good morning and welcome to worship at St. Luke Lutheran Church in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Pastor Noah Heron, and we're so glad to have you with us today. At St. Luke, we have a strong commitment to welcome, and so we always like to begin our worship services with our welcome statement. In response to the call in Romans 15, 7, to welcome their, we welcome to welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you. We warmly welcome people of any race, nationality, sexual orientation, gender, identity, age, and ability. Let us pray. O oh God, our shepherd, you know your sheep by name and lead us to safety through the valleys of death. Guide us by your voice that we may walk in certainty and security to the joyous feast prepared in your house through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for the shepherd, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run away because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but he did, they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, 
I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I am that I am. Most of us recognize this revelation of the divine name in Exodus. Moses asks God's name and God says, tell them that I am sent to you. In our reading today, we hear Jesus invoke this name as he repeats twice, I am the gate. Jesus uses I am statements as metaphors seven times in the Gospel of John, connecting the divine name to life-giving images for the listeners in his context. Today, we frequently encounter these familiar images in our hymns, in our liturgy, in our religious artwork. You'll recognize them. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. For Jesus' audience, the statement, I am, could have stood on its own without any further explanation. In fact, you may recall in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus declares to the guards, I am he, they all step back and fall down to the ground at the pronouncement. This is a bold and powerful claim every time he says it. And yet Jesus decides to expand this I am statement into a series of metaphors to underscore how the presence of God yields abundant life. Several weeks ago during Lent, we read the healing story of a man who was blind from birth. In the larger context of today's passage, we see this familiar format in John's Gospel. First, there's a sign, then there's a dialogue, and finally, a discourse. The healing of the blind man is the sign that points to Jesus being who he says he is. The dialogue, as you may recall, is the Pharisees and the townspeople asking lots of questions about what just happened. And the discourse is where we find ourselves today. In the beginning of today's passage, Jesus picks up where we left off in response to the question of the Pharisees. Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus' discourse, interpreting the recent healing of the blind man, continues to confuse the crowd. The text tells us he used this as a figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. I have to admit, I can sympathize with the crowd because when I read this passage, I felt just as confused. Wait, is Jesus saying he's the shepherd or the gate? I guess we're the sheep and who are the thieves and the bandits? And are there certain sheep that are inside the gate and others that are outside? It's it's really easy to get caught up trying to untangle the details of the mixed metaphors that Jesus is using here. Fortunately, I had some help cutting through the weeds when I read in a commentary that the key to interpreting this passage is Jesus' statement, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The commentator continues, To be distracted by the definitions of the roles in the pastoral play, who is the gatekeeper or who is the shepherd, 
is to miss the image of the abundant life in the emerging realm of God. The abundant life is the vision Jesus has for us all. Through this lens, Jesus' message isn't exclusive at all, but rather an invitation into this abundant life for everyone. Now, when I hear the word gate, I think immediately of a way to keep things out, usually as a protective measure. We use gates to keep our dogs and babies out of danger. I have a coated gate in my apartment building. Yet gates and doors go both ways. They open and they close. They let in and they let out. Jesus points to this when he says, Whoever enters by me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Really, if you think about it, a gate can be a welcome breach in an established and maybe formerly impenetrable wall. I love the word one essayist uses for gate. She calls it an aperture. Now, as you can imagine, I'm a little hesitant to throw any more metaphors in the mix today, but I believe that this one may work for our group. In Sunday school a few weeks ago, I found out that a vast majority of our class had either grown up with a dark room in their home or had experience with dark rooms. So bear with me. When I took a photography class many years ago, we learned all the mechanical functions of the 35 millimeter camera. One of the things that was fascinating to me was learning to adjust the aperture, the opening in the lens that controlled how much light would be exposed to the film. By turning a wheel, you could flood the frame with light or reduce it to a small single point. For amateur photographers such as me and my classmates, we didn't have the experience to know how the exposure would affect our photos until we processed them in the dark room. And when I imagine Jesus as a gate or as an aperture, I can see how he expertly expands and narrows our exposure to reveal the clearest picture of our lives. As he did in the use of the divine name, he narrows the expansiveness of God by bringing it into concrete ways of understanding. We may become overwhelmed with the idea of God as the whole of existence and being transcending space and time, but we can comprehend bread and light and shepherds. Yet Jesus also works in the other direction and expands our narrow understandings of God as well. We may get caught in a rut of seeing God only in one way, as a tiny speck of light, and Jesus flings wide the gate to help us see the infinite light available to us and to all. At the beginning of John's gospel, we are told no one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. So when the Pharisees ask, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus' response, albeit packed and clouded with metaphors, reveals a clear vision for anyone who will pay attention. The heart of God desires abundant life for us all. Jesus tells them he came into the world so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. Jesus stands as the gate to expand our narrow perceptions and focus our distracted attentions until we finally, finally comprehend the way to fullness of life in him. 
during this Easter tide, with the blossoming spring of new life and the promise of resurrection, even from our lowest places. May we all be open to the vision to encounter life and encounter it abundantly. Amen. Let us pray. Penned up in our homes, but united in the one flock of believers, we pray for the church, the earth, the world, and all in need. Asking God, our shepherd, using the words, restore our life. For the church, O oh God, we pray that we will hear and follow your voice calling to us in the world. That bishops and pastors be sustained for their shepherding tasks. That churches devastated by the virus be upheld. That in this time, churches find ways to continue their ministries of education and service. O oh God, faithful shepherd of the church, restore our life. For the earth, we pray that lands and waters be renewed, that animals and plants enjoy safe growth, that rain and soil nurture the fields, that drought and the floods in Yemen be averted and locusts of Kenya cease their frenzy. O oh God, steadfast gardener of the earth, restore our life. For the nations of the world, we pray that heads of state and legislators cooperate for the good of all, that medical experts be heeded, that government monies serve the nation's greatest needs, that during Ramadan, Muslims are granted release from prejudice. O oh God, fearless peacemaker of the nations, restore our life. For a world so economically divided, we pray that the millions of those unemployed be given food and shelter now and jobs in the future, that children find a fruitful means of education, that refugees be safeguarded from violence and prejudice, that inspired by the early Christians, those who have means become ever more generous to those who endure great want. O oh God, just protector of the poor, restore our life. For all in need, we pray that those afflicted with the coronavirus be cared for, that the sick be healed, that those in despair find hope, that those who are lonely be comforted, that medical workers be safeguarded, that those we name here receive the best possible care. O oh God, mighty healer of the sick, restore our life. For our own desires, we pray that like the shepherds Rachel and David, each tending their father's flocks, we will be blessed for the fulfilling our, of our tasks and that you hear the cries of our hearts. Bring your tender care and healing to all those named on our prayer list, in our hearts, on our lips and online. O oh God, tender shepherd of each of us, restore our life. We praise you for those who have died in the faith, remembering this week, Monica, Julian of Norwich, Nicholas Zinzendorf, and those we name before you here. We pray that at our end, as sheep of your own fold, as lambs of your own flock, we will be gathered into your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. O oh God, gateway to life, restore our life. Into your everlasting arms, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your care for us through Jesus Christ, our guardian and friend. Amen. Almighty God, you give us the joy of celebrating our Lord's resurrection. 
Give us also the joys of life in your service and bring us at last to the full joy of life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit in the company of all the saints in the church around the world, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now receive this blessing. The God of all grace bless us now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Thank you so much for joining us today for worship. Um, Your presence is honored and valued. We invite you to our coffee chat on our on our Zoom line channel. I'm not really sure what you call it. On Zoom uh, at 11. So that will be happening in about 10 minutes. If you don't have instructions on how to get onto Zoom, please email me at pastor at stlukeatlanta.org. That information is in the notes on this post. Um, also, I'd like to ask you if this service is meaningful to you at all, please consider contributing to St. Luke. Uh, there's a link online to help us continue our ministry in these difficult times. Um, I pray that you all have a blessed and wonderful week, and uh, we'll see you again next Sunday.